Okay. Sorry, Madam Afafa. Sorry, Madam Afafa. Can you continue, please? Yes, leadership. Uh, let, uh, let, uh, let me uh, let me continue. Yes. Um, what I was trying to say is that uh, from the paragraph that you've been read, uh, OSHA uh, for Doctor Ngomengrume is trying to bring the dialectic uh, understanding, uh, as the paragraph is said, you would see uh, uh, how the universe. Uh, have been created and how everything operates in the universe. But he also highlighted the part that uh, where is the part where he say that the opposition of interest, the social opposition between inside and outside is dialectical in nature. When we speak about dialectical, we speak about ideas uh, that exist uh, uh, within a society. Uh, for example, the issue of inside and outside uh, from the theology that we've been uh, uh, reading uh, here. Uh, what he tries to un uh, unpack is on the issue of religion to say that, yes, religion is a tool uh, that others can use uh, for social gains. And also, it is true that some believe that uh, the universe is a result of, of God. Uh, his argument is that he agreed with the writings of Marx to say that uh, when Marx uh, uh, disagreed in several times with the religion and, and, and cited that religion is a tool uh, that is being used for oppression, uh, because from the from the concept from the dialectical understanding of the inside and outside. Uh, when when us as African have to use religion uh, to define the universe, it then draws away the, our 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 understanding uh, to the outside to say that our problems that exist uh, are from an outside understanding outside uh, outside from the from what is happening, which means that. Uh, the spiritual beliefs and everything that exists, then we, it takes to shift our 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 concentration to these beliefs. Then we have to to understand the concrete uh, environment that we are living in to say what is the cause of our problem. That is the way he cited the, uh, uh, my own my understanding, uh, on my thinking is that that is the way he's he's trying to also make the point to say religion. Uh, is another form or uh, that is being used uh, by opportunists uh, for there. I can say that opportunities, uh, we know that those are maybe, uh, liberals, conservatives, those are opportunists who also have to serve the agenda of the West, of the imperialists who introduced uh, some of these uh, religion, uh, some of, uh, of this uh, religion. I, I think my understanding uh, will will be on that part. But also what I understand about what he, what he also argued is that as much as the question of inside and outside is there, also on the issue of religion, uh, a religion uh, uh, is on the on the last paragraph where I your brother made brother a, Mafafa. A, brother Mafafa, I yes. can hear an echo is it just me or there seems to be an echo coming from your your uh, presentation unless yeah. it's just me i don't know if others can also hear the echo um sorry to interrupt your your train of thought but please please continue thank you uh, yeah, yeah, yes leadership i think uh, i think it may be or, or it may be on my side uh, uh, anyway, there is a, a part. Yes, uh, there is a part when he said on the paragraph when the relative political consolidation consolidation aimed at is is uh, is uh, aimed at is achieved, the tactic is dropped, but the religious uh, 
the, re the reviving of really a religion which is a uh, fomenting and exploited cannot be easily checked uh it is essential to emphasize in the historical condition of Africa that the state must be must be secular. I think he also argued at some particular point, as much as religion can be used as a tool of as an instrument of exploitation, but there are values which we can draw from religion, according to my understanding, which which at some particular point we can say that are correct as much the religion itself it's a it can it can be an instrument of it can be you and it is an instrument of oppression uh, let me end let me end there thanks uh, uh, thank you very much for your extended exposition which has been really helpful now in the meantime others have joined us uh including uh, dr herman who i can see has joined us um, Dr. Herman, you had your camera on, and then because we all had our cameras off, you turn your off as well. Uh, please feel free to have your camera on. Uh, don't look at uh, the others who don't have their cameras on. Feel free to have your camera on. Um, yeah. So yeah. So thank you very much for your extended extended uh, presentation. For the sake of those who joined us not too long ago, and to make clear what it is that we are discussing. Uh, I'd like to read that, what has been read by by the pigeon. I want to read it again, so that we are all clear what it is we are discussing. Yes. I've, I've yes. also decided. I've also decided to copy the text in the chat so that somebody can follow up through the chat. So I've also like copied the whole text that you've Excellent. read in the chat. The screen cannot allow all of Excellent. it to be together. So I've done it in the chat also. Excellent. Excellent. So please look in the chat where the text has been posted by Brother Pigeon. Please, if you don't have the book, the e-version, uh, let us know, either Michael or Brother Pigeon, and we can send you an e-version. Let me read that paragraph for us, which uh, Reed, or Brother Mafafa has exquisitely um, given us exposition. It reads that, and I'm reading the last paragraph on the page, and it goes like this, it says, Many African countries, uh, sorry, many African societies, in fact, forestall this kind of perversion. The dialectical contradiction between inside and outside was reduced by making the visible world continuous with the visible world. For them, for them, Sorry, I'm just uh, muting a few people so I can continue. I've done so. I've muted. Continue. Okay. All right. Let me continue. <clears throat> so, for them, heaven was not outside the world, but inside it. These African societies did not accept transcendentalism and may indeed be regarded as having attempted to synthesize the dialectical opposites inside and outside, uh, outside and inside, by making them continuous, that is, by abolishing them. In present day Africa, however, a recognition of the dialectical contradiction between inside and outside has a great deal contribute to the process of decolonization and development or oh, it helps us to anticipate colonialist and imperialist devices for furthering exploitation by diverting our energies from secular concerns the recognition of the dialectical opposition is universally necessary religion is an instrument of bourgeois social reaction. But its social use is not always confined to colonialists and imperialists. Its success in their hands can exercise a certain fascination 
on the minds of Africans who begin by being revolutionary but are bewitched by any passing opportunist chance to use religion to make political gains. Seizing the slightest of these chances, they in fact take two steps backward but the one step forward in order to enjoy a transitory consolidation based on a common religious belief and practice. This idiosyncratic tactic can only create more problems than it promises to solve. For certain, check the advancing social consciousness of the people. Right? In the long run, a dialectical opposition between church and state will be recreated. What begins by being a dialectical move coming entrenched. This idiosyncratic tactic actively encourages religious forms and practices as well as a religious ideology. When the relative political consolidation aimed at at its aimed at is achieved, the tactic is dropped. But the religious revivalism which has fermented, exploited, cannot so easily be checked. It is essential to emphasize historical condition of Africa that the state must be secular. Stop. That's the end of the reading. So I've read it again so that those who uh, didn't hear from repeating reading and also uh, hear it being read again and those who had difficulty understanding it the first time I've had a chance to listen again and to read it again on the screen. So, with that said, I love to thank Brother Mafafa, uh, but I'd like to ask Brother Mafafa a question before I move on to someone else. Brother Mafafa, you, did you think that the inside-outside is natural? Uh, yes, Chair. Uh, uh, may you repeat your question? Like... Uh, so, in your presentation, you said that the inside outside was 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 nature was natural. That's why I'm asking you: Do you think it's natural, or is it a way of conceiving the world? I know you missed um, the last some of the lessons because of, like you said, low shedding problems. But at this point is very important that we understand that the world in which we live, the cosmos. Um, that yeah. You can't, you can't conceptualize it as having an outside or not having an outside. Whichever you take, whichever you accept, it needs to be understood that it is just a theoretical conception and that it is not out there in nature. That's why I'm asking you that question so that we're all clear that the inside-outside thesis is just a way of looking at the world. Does that make sense? That That is... That is the question I'm asking you. So do you think it's natural? Y yes. Uh, my belief is that I think it's natural. And also what I am thinking of is that uh, as, as human beings uh, living in the universe and the argument to say uh, it is through matter and spirit a, that a human being may may exist, but matter a, is powerful, come first than the spirit. A, it is it is it is the concept. Maybe I'm I'm standing in. I'm understanding. The, thanks. Why do you say matter is more powerful? Yes, because in 
in our studies, you have uh, been reading uh, the philosophical concept of uh, uh, the philosophy, uh, as we begin the philosophical concept, as you can know that uh, from the letters that we use, we speak about the philosophical uh, materialism. Uh, and we are speaking about things that can be seen, things that are concrete, uh, things that uh, we can make re a reference to, for example, uh, water and everything. But when you speak about spirit, uh, spiritual things, uh, those are uh, abstract uh, things, uh, those are ideas. So at some particular point, uh, as individual, we do have spiritual uh, spirituality within ourselves that uh, some call it cards uh, that usually tell you something, but you cannot make a reference of it. But what I believe is that the matter of everything that exists is the one that should uh, guide us. Thank you. But do you not think, last question, Brother Mafafa, do you not think that spirit is part of matter? Uh, in human, uh, I think for for the way I understand, it, for human to I make an, let me make an example of a human. Uh, for me, the way I understand is that in matter there was a, a spirit in truth. That is the concept that I I concept I, I I conceive it for a human being. For me to exist, there is a mixture of matter and spirit. Thank you, thank you very much. Let's go to someone else. Thank you for your extended exposition, Brother Mafafa. For those of you who have joined us for the first time, <clears throat> this is a, a Constantism study class where we study the philosophy and ideology of Constantism, which is the distillation of the theoretical, philosophical, scientific, ideological, political, and economic theory, understanding that was used by Pan-Africanists uh, to fight for the liberation of Africa. Pan-African conferences themselves uh, go very far back to 1900, until 1900, started in the US, and then it moved to England, and then it moved to Africa. Then the Pan-African struggle at that level has been going on on the African continent. Recently, we are witnesses to Niger and the fight for our for their resources. So, if you are here, welcome. You are uh, at the Constantism study class. The philosophy and ideology of Constantism is that is that which uh, has been bestowed or left for us as our legacy, and it's for us to understand it in order that we can wage the war um, that is required by the war here. I don't necessarily mean physical war. I mean the ideological and philosophical war. Because that war is the highest, is the highest form of war. Fighting to obliterate people's minds. Getting them to see the world as you see it, even though you're an enemy. But they can do your will as, as even though you're an enemy, they do your will. That is the highest form of war. Uh, and so and so we are reading and discussing this book. And the reason we are doing it is so that we'll conscientize as many Africans as possible. On Saturday we meet, we also discuss the unification of Africa and the one old African government. Again, that is because this is not being discussed amongst Africans enough. And so we want that, that conversation to it, it is there, but it's not it's not enough to mobilize our people to say to the 55 new colonial governments who are not looking after them to say enough is enough. We now want one continent government, our government, because we are the leadership. We want to now choose our servants who will serve us, not servants who become lords over us. So welcome to Constantism, uh, the philosophy and ideology of decolonization specific reference, African Revolution. So welcome. Uh, so let's, we are still um, uh, hearing people's thoughts on the reading we have read. It's 
that Marlene's hand is up. So I will go to her and ask her to share her thoughts, uh, unless she has a question. In which case, I, I have a question. 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 Someone is trying to join, but they can't seem to get into the link. Um, yeah, that, that happens. Sister, Sister Marlene, that happens for all kinds of reasons. Sometimes it's not um, us, it, it's just that, it, that in, the internet. Oh, you mean they want a password? It's a 1,000. And what is the other 1, thing? Okay, Brother Pigeon, can you uh, liaise with Sister Marlin behind the scenes, please? And help and help um, give her the what she needs to get the other person to come in. Uh, thank you. Right, let's hear from... We have a Brother Charles. I don't know if it's your first time you've joined us, Brother Charles. But before I come to Charles, or well, well, before I continue, I want to welcome you all. So, Senator uh, Kumuchi, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Kumichi, uh, Charles, Charles, uh, Dr. Herman, Mafafa, Sister Shola, uh, Brother Kwame Gonza, Sister Marlin, Sister Ida, Brother Pigeon. Brother Michael has dropped off. Um, Brother Pigeon, can you find out whether Brother Michael has any challenge, whether you can rejoin us, please. Thank you. So, uh, uh, please, uh, Brother Kwame, can you here. just move? Yep. Excuse me, please. Could you just move the writing a bit to the right so that we can see both pages? Okay. Thank in that you. case, I'll make it smaller. That's the only way you can see. No, both it just pages. needs yeah? to move a bit because there's still a gap at the on the right. Yeah. Okay. I'm, can you see it? All yeah. Now? Lovely. Thank you. Yes. See it all. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, the beginning of the paragraph is lower down. And the top of the other paragraph is up there. So you can't see all of it at the same time. But this is the bulk of it on the right. So I'll leave that on that page. But Thank anyone you. is free to ask me to, to go to the left and so they can read um, the last paragraph on page 12. OK, so let's continue hearing from everyone. So let's hear from from Brother, Brother Gonza, please. If you. But I hope you've had time to now digest and understand a bit more. Thank you. Yes, well, when you read through the second time, I was able to uh, pick up. Um, uh, I think, let me start from the end. I think the uh, the philosopher here yes. is... Start, start, start from whatever you like, brother. Okay. Okay, yeah, so I think uh, from the end, the philosopher is is trying to point out that the state or the African state, in this case, the, the African government, uh, which we are pursuing, must be looked at as a secular state uh, in a sense that it should be looked at as an institution that is responsible for delivering material benefits to the people, to its people. It is not an institution uh, for delivering maybe spiritual uh, or exactly it is not an institution for delivering spiritual edification and uh, you know uh, things of benefits of this nature uh, and therefore it goes back to look at how uh, colonialism uses this to manipulate and then of course the political demagogues use the fact that religion is needed by man or spirituality is part of man they use this to manipulate that you know sit here and wait for god to come and give you you know your heaven and then they will take what belongs to you they deny you what belongs to you and then of course he goes ahead to to mention how uh, the demagogues or the liars you know, the ones who want to, to use the people's power expediently, uh, they exploit this, the fact that people are present or human beings are spiritual, they use this advantage to manipulate that religion into uh, getting to power, not knowing that it could backfire in, in one way or uh, another. So that is when uh, he emphasizes that uh, the state should not present itself as some institution which has come to uh, bring about spiritual edification and spiritual benefits, but rather is an institution which is coming to bring 
uh, material benefits to the people, and that is the health, the education, good roads, and all these, the good life of the people, and therefore it is secular. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Follow-up question, Brother Gonza. Do you think that human beings are spiritual? Um, I think that human beings are spiritual, depending on uh, where the person is. Uh, the fact that we aspire to uh, we aspire to so regardless of what you believe, uh, we all aspire to something greater than ourselves. So I think that human beings are spiritual. That is at least for from me. So whether somebody who is practicing, uh, uh, you know, who's practicing, uh, how do you call it, uh, meditation, people like Nkuma himself who used to go and and meditate. I think this is an attempt to attain or to tap into something which is higher than you or to, to tap into some form of higher power. So I think this this makes you, uh, makes us spiritual. I will not talk for everyone. So why do you think that there is an overemphasis on the spiritual and less emphasis on the materialists? I think that uh, in the in the African setting, there is no so much overemphasis. If if we look at things from what Nkuma even is explaining, it is very clear when he was talking about it at the beginning here that uh, in Africa there was no distinction between the physicality, the presence, the present, the now, and the heaven. But it is a continuous process. There's no distinction. It is. I think it is uh, it is the European when he gets things he overemphasizes one thing like for example uh, at the Africa Climate Summit recently uh, President Afaki Isaiah of Eritrea was hearing people he was speaking at this summit when they gave him a chance to speak and they asked him what he is doing in Eritrea to stem climate change and he said that. You people are here mentioning climate change, you know, mentioning private sector, for example, against you know the state, but this is not the issue. These institutions they should work together; it should perform its duty. So now, what I'm trying to explain is that when the European gets something, he overemphasizes one thing as this is the this is the Democrats; they are the only ones who are you know extremism. But in African society, it has always found a way of reconciling these two things, the being now, the physicality, and the continuation. And that is why we had, we had, or we have, we still have the ancestral worship, because we believe that these people transition, but they are still part of us. And we even go and pray to them, and we should help us. I mean, when I was growing up, even in the village, uh, my grand, my, my aunties, some of them were having problems conceiving and we would go to uh, to the burial places where we bury our ancestors to sacrifice and pray so that these people can be able to conceive. Maybe there was a belief that maybe one of them died hungry and stuff like that. So this is the belief that there's a continuation and therefore we are part of them, they are part of us. So there's, there's no distinction of saying that Oh, this one is a spiritual, but we are all in one. And, and I think this is precisely even what Nkuma, but he, you know, what Nkuma is trying to explain at the beginning of this, uh, at the beginning of this uh, uh, so-called uh, what? Uh, verse and uh, yeah, so, uh, so I think it is precise. It is, it is precise, this paragraph uh, in his presentation. So even in society, African society, when you examine, you can see it. Okay, so you're saying that um, before Europeans came, Africans had a holistic perspective on life and they were able to yes. reconcile that which they couldn't see with some call it spiritual and that which yes. they could see that people called, could be called the material. So the Africans were able to reconcile them. And then when the Europeans came, you were saying they started emphasizing one thing over, um, over emphasizing. So, yeah so in the what we've read they emphasize the spiritual 
Why do you think that the European emphasized the spiritual as opposed to the material? I think that uh, I think that for them, some of the knowledge they they failed to deal with some of the knowledge. Uh, let me uh, go back to, uh, for example, when the Plato's and the Socrates started coming here to learn. They took this knowledge, but the knowledge was not able even, you know, in BC, they started coming and they took the knowledge to back to Greece, but they were not able even to use that knowledge, even though we hear Socrates was wisest and stuff like that. But they were not able to use this knowledge to build up states, functional states, until later, until when we see uh, the, the Moors coming from Africa, again, going to, through Spain and to colonize Europe and go in to educate them much more. That is when Europe started coming up and building functional states. But before that, they were not having uh, any functional states. So the ever, ever emphasis, over emphasis on one branch of knowledge, I think is, is a misunderstanding, the lack of misunderstanding of how things interact and function with each other. And this is why it has majorly held an, uh, uh, African societies together more and helped them, even other societies like Indians and Chinese, it, has, it is the one which has helped them to build functional civilizations, which of course have had interactions and stuff like that but they have been a little bit more continuous because these groups of people, for them, they understand how all things interact and they benefit each other. Instead of saying, this is it, you know, this is the most important, and then the other one is the most important, and then, then you, you create extremism, you, you create two extreme sides, and that is what you find that when you go to Europe, you find that they would spend 10 years they are fighting one war, 10 years, they come. So this level of extremism, I mean, is the one which is which is uh, creating actually even the problems which we are seeing today in the world. So the lack of understanding of how to use the knowledge when it is brought, I think that is the problem for me that I see. Thank you for your excellent exposition. I think you've also touched on the analytical perspective of the practice of science. So analysis is when you break things up. And the belief is that to understand something, you break it up into its constituent parts and understand it. Uh, after you've broken it down to its constituent parts and you've understood it, you need to bring it all together holistically. It appears that the European mind, from what you are saying, is incapable of of uh, bringing everything together holistically. And this is also the source of all the wars because to breaking things up is akin to just going to war and breaking things up, killing people here and there, stealing people's resources and so on and so forth. And So, and, so please and, allow me to, to come back oh, a little bit more. Just one minute, just a, a few seconds. Yeah, uh, so, yeah do and then we'll go to... Another. Yes, one go other on. example, I think, is what the Chinese now are doing with... with uh, the so-called socialism and capitalism. Now, these people have integrated the two ideas and they have been able to coexist with them and build something explosive out of it. Yet the West, they are still extremists. They are being extreme in their approach. And this is very evident even today when we are talking, what we are talking about right now is evident right now. They are still insisting in their extremism that you have to go this side where we want you. We, you have to go this way. And these guys are saying that, no, there's another way. They said, no, there's no way. And now they want to fight. They are sending ships into the South, South China Sea. They want to fight China. Why are you not agreeing what we are saying? So I think that this is, there's a level of intolerance and extremism and lack of understanding and digesting, you know, how things interact and how the knowledge is supposed to be are used mm. and, and pick up one knowledge and concentrate on it and then you become an extremist and very dangerous, of course, to the, to the rest of humanity. 
Oh, yeah, I think the the way you have ended is 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 evidence for us for the African to rise and take back uh, leadership because um, the the example you have given is showing that the 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 West is incapable of providing global leadership in anything because they just cannot think like that. Um, and 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 I don't know if we realize that what China is doing is what consensusism has yeah, says should be done in terms of capitalism and socialism. So what China is doing is what Nkrumah said we should do. And I don't think people realize that, that China basically have taken on board what we Africans were saying through Kwab Nkrumah many years ago, just, just as uh, Malaysia took Ghana's seven-year development plan and transformed Malaysia into what it is today, when Ghana that created the seven-year development plan itself and invited uh, top economists to Ghana, eh, you know, to have a look at it in those days, Ghana itself is now far behind. So the African is, is capable of holistic thinking, and I think that is what the world needs. Uh, following the West has not really helped anybody. Anyway, so let's hear from others. Uh, those who have just joined us, if you are still here, welcome, Brother Koku. We are commenting on our reading, and that reading is a continuation of the inside outside thesis. Brother Pigeon, your hand is up, please. I mean, yeah, thank you. Uh, I've been really feeling to come in. <laughs> yeah. I know, do. Uh, so you want yeah. to share your your thinking, is that correct? Yes. Excellent. So, Brother Pigeon, carry on. Share your thinking, please. Okay. Thank you for the screen you are sharing with us now in the previous reading, which is very important for us to understand the reading now we are doing. Because from this previous reading, it's very, been very clear that there has been two opinions of outside and inside. And the outside and inside are not only in words but are in the forces that influence us. And that's why the spirituality that, of course, you are asking the Christian or the West are insisting on came with an idea to Africans that there's something outside the universe and that there's another universe outside the universe. And that's why it says here where you should lay your treasures and your development and all your aspiration outside there. That there, if you keep it there, then someone will say, if you keep it there, it cannot be touched by anything. It says the treasures in the heaven where moths do not corrupt. So they are coming with a spiritual angle to Africans that there is no need for you to struggle inside here. You need to put much investment outside there. So that comes in the spiritual realms. And they say that there are forces outside there as it goes, that there are forces outside there that actually control everything here. So it's like when you are staying in your community or in Africa here, some people tell you, no, don't develop Africa. Don't think of Africa. There's something outside there that's very important. So think outside there. Don't think Africa, you see. And that's why it goes down there and Karl Marx said that the religion, as it said, the course of such society is determined by Suso. And he says, it is the recognition of this contradiction and the use of to which might be put to be exploitation of the workers. Karl Marx knew very well that instead of the workers to work to develop their countries and their nations, they are being lied to that they should work on their spiritual being so that they can invest and develop something outside. And you see, so this is where the contradictions comes in and it starts in. And this was intentionally put to Africans. As Brother Falk has been explaining, the gospel came in with an intention. It was not to develop Africa, but actually to shift the African mentality from their resources so that they can think outside Africa in order for them to stop thinking about their resources, their minerals, and everything else. So I think that's where this thing comes from, from that beginning that we've shared above. The night goes down to what, of course, that's why uh, it goes down to now where we are reading today. So from that beginning, let me go, it says that the African society, in fact, forestalled this kind of perversion. They had known it, and that's why in the African society, there's no like death, and then there's a the world outside after death. There was what you call reincarnations. So when somebody dies, 
there will be somebody who will be born and will be named after the person who died and that this person will not go somewhere else. He will come back again into life. So there was a reincarnation. African society believed that everything was to be done on this continent and on this planet or whatever this universe. That life has to, it has to continue and recreate. And that's what they say there, that there was process of continuations and transcendism, that somebody transcend from either the dead to the living, to the living, to the dead, the dead, something like that. So you move in the stages. Well, the West came in with this idea to, in order to contradict and change our mentality. So generally, even as you move down, you see when they say that the religion is an instrument of the Petit or Bujua's social reaction. So they wanted to put the poor people so much busy with religion and religion and religion, while in real sense, they were focusing on the material condition of the people to exploit whatever was available as they pamper people with religion and people forget about this. And that's why it goes somewhere and says, Africans who begin being revolutionary but are bewitched by passing opportunist chance to use religion to make political gains. So then religion became a politics. You see, when, when we are studying the African tradition and uh, society before, the king was more of spiritual being, but now they brought politics into the the chief now became the spirit, the political leader and the spiritual leader. So politics became now an advantage of this. And that's why, like in Kenya here, when the president was elected, the people said that's a God-chosen president. And in all over Africa, this is a tendency that is being told to us. When a president is elected, they are, we are told that the leaders are appointed by God. So whether they corrupted, they stole election to be in, they're appointed by God. And we should accept that, you see? It is it, some form of putting our mentality into a certain cave so that we don't ask more. And that's why it's, Nkrumah says any time that the people tried to make some steps forward, they were brought backward with these certain solutions and certain myths or whatever conditions. So generally, this is what I'm trying to gather here, that it is actually, that's why Nkrumah says we should not lay emphasis on religion for a state to develop. Because laying emphasis on religion makes more people think not of what we are doing in the continent or in the universe here, but think of what will be outside the core or universe. Somebody will be saying, oh, me, I want to be going to church every day, to pray every day, to offer sacrifice every day, so that when I die, I'll go to heaven. They don't think of even what is going on here. In Africa, for example, you find people go to many churches all over. Instead of even converting the churches to industry to bring money and something, they are poor people, they don't have a job, but they will go to church, pray from the morning to night. After that, they come back in the house, they have nothing to eat, they contribute the little money they have to those pastors and bishops. The bishops and pastors invest money in business, drive big vehicles, people remain poor forever, you see? So I think this is the mentality that Nkrumah wanted to get us off, and it's what we should get ourselves off, because it was intentionally put on us to ensure that we don't focus on our material resources in Africa and in the continent, in the society, that we focus on heaven, where those who are telling us to focus on heaven came in, looted our resources, looted our material, and developed their countries. And this is what I think this text is all about. So thank you very much, Brother Kwame. Back to you. Brother Kwame? Uh, brother, thank you very much. Follow up question. So that is what, brother, that is what uh, the imperialists did. They brought us religion and got us to focus outside our world. And they claimed that there was a world outside called heaven, even though for Africans, there was no heaven outside. If there is heaven instead of us, which is why we poured libation. And when we poured libation, it was a recognition that the world was continuous, that the past and the present and the future are all one. That was what libation meant, which is why if you, look, if you listen to the invocation, it, it fuses all, all three. And it's all scientific, as we, as, we, as we understand. And so my question to you, Brother Pigeon, is that so that's what the imperialists did. But are, are our African politicians not doing the same? As an African politician, <laughs> you know, do, do you not do you not find that one of the one of the places you will find African politicians is in church? And and what business has African politicians doing in church? We are not saying that. The question is not that. 
people should not express their beliefs. Everybody is free to express their beliefs, whatever their belief is. But if you are a public servant, if you are a public servant and your job is to serve those who elect you, what's your business going to sit in the church telling them to pray or telling them to pray for rain instead of irrigating the land and so on? So that's my question to you. Do you not think that the politicians are doing exactly what Nkrumah said they should do? Thank you. I'll give a tricky pick or example of what happened in my country. Uh, the president, the current president called William Ruto, during his campaign, he could move to churches every Saturday and Sunday, and he was donating millions of Kenya shillings to the churches for building the church, construction of the churches, and all pastors were welcoming in every church. Well, the opposition leader who was contesting with him was not going to churches, and therefore he was called, he was demonic, he is satanic and demonic and evil. And this other person was referred to be as being the holy one. Then over a period of time, uh, when he got to, he got, of course, many church people voted him. I remember one day they called for a national prayer day in the state house, that people should pray for hunger, pray for rain, and the wife of the president is the preacher and the pastor. So they prayed. Then they called for a national prayer day. People did not come out. The, the government had to transport people to the venue so that they pray for the nation. This has continued. And over a period of time, after they were elected, the first thing they did, in fact, they have regulated churches. This president now decided to close churches. He has closed so many churches, including one of the prophetic churches by called Professor, Prophet Uwur, who is a prophet in Kenya, calling himself prophet. Then now this president who used the church to get into power has now decided to close those churches. Then even this new rule that passed the LGBTQ rule, that passed in Kenya, now he's the one who has passed it under his regime, and people are saying, now, how are you turning against the church? So one thing I think that the churches has been used as an instrument to gain the population, because majority of Africans are in churches, the politicians go to churches to meet the people, and they know many people in the church. So when they go to church and speak of the church issues, they will appear like being holy. I remember one time some church leaders said that the politicians will never be given space to speak in the churches. They should speak outside the church because the church place is a holy place as the church people think of it. So when you ask me the question, what are the politicians doing in the church? They're going for the people in the church. They are looking after votes. That's basically what they're doing. They're not going to pray. They're looking for votes. And that's now what they follow up. So, so you are confirming that what Ikrumah said will happen is what is happening. Okay, thank you very yes. much. Mr. Aida, let's hear from you, please. Uh, um, I'm not sure that I really have um, too much to say, though I have been listening carefully. Um, my my thing that I've noticed uh, is but that... Hold on, hold on, hold on, Sister Aida. You didn't have to say you don't have too much to say. I don't, I don't, little, I don't. Uh, okay, how, okay. However, hold on, listen, listen. Whatever little you have to say is what you have to say. For us, it is precious. So please don't... Well, you don't, uh, need to, well, you don't, don't get to too preface, precious about it. <laughs> Don't, okay. Don't preface your contribution with that, please. Um, well, I'm, 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 I'm going from uh, today. I think that um, the inside and the outside can slightly be changed because I think last week it was uh, to me it was about um, outer space, um, the universe, and then the world. But this week, I think that um, the inside and the outside is possibly about, in my view. Um, about Africa being the inside and the diaspora being the outside was how I was looking at it. So I realized that to me it was a total change. Um, so I'm not sure if we can change things um, as as we go along. But that was one thing I wanted to query. Um, I think the religion bit, um, that it's... Oh, oh, hold uh, on. Can I, uh -huh. can I respond to that before you continue? Let me okay. respond to that. Okay. It's not, it's not, it's okay for you to query it, mm -hmm. but there's no point querying it. Because if you recall a week ago, mm -hmm. you raised a very, this very point. And I assured you that that was one way of conceiving the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, there are different ways of conceptualizing the world. Mm-hmm. And so it's up to it's up to everyone, depending on the problem that you think you want to solve, 
you conceptualize the world in a, in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And you create that di dialectic so that you can solve the problem. Right. However, you recall that we said that that is just a way of looking at the world. Yeah. Even if you look, even if you take the continent and, and the diaspora where you and I are at the moment, mm -hmm. Comrade Pigeon, uh, uh, Brother Senator, uh, uh, Brother Mafafa, they could argue that they are inside Africa and then we are outside mm -hmm. Africa. Mm -hmm. Aha. Now, that is one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is to say, is to say that, actually, Brother Mafafa, Brother Pigeon, uh, Brother Senator, all of us, including us here, because we are Africans, actually, we are all inside. Nobody's outside. That we are all Africans. So, yes. again, yes. That but way, that's what that I is was a way saying. Of, that is, yeah, that's a way of that... looking at it. Not, mm -hmm. uh, the point I'm making is that Either way of looking at it is legitimate, depending on what it is you want to talk about and what it is you want to solve. But I mm -hmm. think that a key point you've made, which is for me, is a great observation. Because I think that sometimes we fall into this trap. The chapter we are dealing with is a chapter on philosophy in retrospect, meaning that it is about our universe, our cosmos, and how it is conceived. The problem with us human beings is that the moment we look at the universe, we think we are so important that everything else is not important anymore. It is a human world, it's human thought, it's, it's human life, it is our countries, and everything about us, that is the most important. Somehow, even Animals are not important. Plants mm -hmm. are not important. The, the rivers are not important. Mm -hmm. It's as if those things are not important anymore. So I think the point you are making is you are reminding us, and thank you for this, that however much we apply what we are reading to Africa, in this chapter, we are looking at the cosmos in which we live and how we should understand it. And the inside-outside thesis it's just one way of looking at it. It doesn't mean that the world has an outside. It doesn't mean that. Mm -hmm. yeah? But but that is one way of looking at it. So thank you for reminding us that this is what we are dealing with. And you are right, therefore, to query it in that sense. And, and, and the first, last thing I will say about that before you carry on is that this is why people come to consciousness and they fail to grasp it. They fail to grasp it because they don't understand the beginning of thinking. They think thinking begins with thinking itself. They think thinking begins with what is in your mind as a human being, forgetting that what you are thinking comes from your environment. It comes from outside you. That you weren't born with thoughts. You were born in your, you were conceived in your mother's womb. You came into the world. You listened to people around you, started with your parents, then your, 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 your friends, then your whatever, and then and so on. And as you, you your circle widened, you got more and more and more information. You understand? And all mm -hmm. that is from your environment. Sometimes we forget that. And then we even forget that the universe was there before we even arrived on this planet. Mm -hmm. You know, before man arrived on this planet, the universe was already there. We we don't really matter in that sense. We think we are so important. And this is where the Caucasian, the the West. It's even worse. At they are the worst culprits. They think everything should revolve around them. It's as if they are the most important things in the whole in the whole cosmos. I'll, I'll pause there. So thank you for reminding us that we are talking about the universe, the cosmos itself, and what it is made of, and the extent of the cosmic raw material, and how we can use the inside alpha thesis to conceive of it. Thank you. Now you can carry on. Oh, okay. Um, and then the other thing that I found interesting that um, I, I feel we have to talk about is that um, religion is an instrument of bourgeois society, social Bourge reaction. Bourgeois. 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 Okay, bourgeois. bourgeois. The word is bourgeois. Bourgeois. Okay. And the the noun is bourgeoisie. Uh, yes. So just so you know, bourgeois yeah. is, is an adjective. Okay. Yeah, bourgeois is an adjective. The noun is bourgeoisie. 
The bourgeoisie are the elites. Uh, the elites, yeah. like uh, those who tell us to pray, but they don't pray themselves. They come to church, tell us to vote for them, that we should pray, mm -hmm. and then they, but they don't pray themselves. When they want money, they don't pray to God. They go to the bank because the bank, because they control the central bank, and they go and take the money or they divert it for themselves. But they tell us to go and pray. Yeah, yeah carry on. Thank you. Um, um, and the bit about religion is an instrument um, of colonialists and imperialists. Um, because it would seem that, especially in, in Africa, it's something that is used to um, modify, when I say modify, um, to um, um, calm people and and um, stop the struggle because it's a way of um, um, indoctrinating people that there, there's always going to be a better tomorrow or there's always, you know, this isn't our home. We're just passing through sort of thing. Um, so I felt that that was very important. Um, uh, so we're always, when you use religion, it always stops people from... Um, actually being really militant, even though in religion there is militant religion in, in when it's helping other people or, or um, helping society. But more often than not, it's just a way of um, calming people and um, taking away their fear in some way. Uh, so I, I think those were the two things that I focused on because I was a bit lost on, on some of the others. When I say a bit lost, um, it didn't stand out so um, there was a lot of idiosyncrasy uh, I think it was used more it was used a couple of times and I thought ooh do I really know the meaning of this word in, in what it's it's saying here um, because I think idiosyncrasy is um, it, it means not quite right I think I think so I'm not sure uh, so maybe somebody could help me on idiosyncrasy. What you mean? What um, it means? You mean? Uh, well, yes, because it was used. It, it he kept using it, and yeah, I was yeah. thinking, do I really know the meaning of this word? Oh, so, it's an English word. Is, yes. Yeah, I can, yeah. I can, I can, I can read the definition from you from the dictionary. Does that helps. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, Thank you. So continue talking. I'll read it. I'll find it and read it for you. Um, so that was it. I, I think it was a lot about. Um, um, I, I think the Marxist way would be religion being the opium of the people, and I think it is, especially in a, a lot of Africa, even though there are other religions. But then, people, <laughs> I remember. Sorry, I'm laughing because I remember once being told that. Um, uh, you know, there's Sunday Christians who people will go to church, but during the week they'll go elsewhere for their religion. And it wasn't just that, you know, they were doing bad things, but they were actually part of different religions uh, during the week. So I've always remembered that from a long time ago. So that's all I've really got. Yeah, thank you. Idiosyncrasy means, this is from the Chambers Dictionary. It means... Um, peculiarity of temperament or mental constitution, any characteristic of a person, a sensitivity exhibited by an individual, a particular food, drug, etc. So that's what it means. It also means, uh, idiosyncratically means mixing together uh, from the word sin, S I Y, which is synthesize as for example to synthesize yeah so it's basically people's characteristics how people see things how people do things idiosyncrasy is idiosyncratic their personal way of doing things so what he's saying is that the african african can i say thieves because that's what they are you know they just come and steal our resources i mean how can bazoom be selling uranium for less than ten dollars when the market price is about over a hundred dollars I mean, how can a president be doing that? I mean, isn't that is blatant stealing, isn't it? Anyway, um, so that is what it means. Thank you very much. Let's hear from others. So let's go to uh, brother, brother Senator. Brother Senator Morgan. 
Let's hear from you, please. Thank you. Uh, let's rem remind ourselves that we are free to pass if we feel we don't want to say anything. That's perfectly okay. Uh, but we encourage everyone to share their thoughts. Yeah. Brother Senator, no, what do you think? No, 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 thank you. Today I'm actually doing most of the listening, but I concur. <laughs> I, I concur with most of the contributions put forward here. We need to really look into this matter of religion very carefully, and we need to look at, it, at its originality and its main purposes when it was introduced to, to, to African countries. And uh, when it was introduced, so many cultural uh, facts that Africans were doing were then abandoned. We know before the, in case of uh, Christianity, before it came to Africa, Africans had their own ways of living. They were managing their systems of governance. They were managing their economic systems, their social systems, which was so coherent with African people. And it was almost uniform from Cape to Cairo. All African countries had some form of uh, governance which they were using according to our culture, identity, and originality. These systems were not developed to modern days. They were then abandoned after colonization. We need to really rethink and reconnect with the old days and see how we can modernize them to suit our own ways of living as Africans. I do believe if Africans would develop their own ways of living, their own ways of social governance, political and economic, will be able to develop African natural resources according to our own ethics and our ex our knowledge. Uh, the fact that we are used borrowed systems, which are Western-based, it's very difficult to, to adopt and put into practice the Western systems to the African people. The way I see as if we have, we have failed, we are failing to think beyond religion because we are being limited, because we always think that things will come from heaven, things will come afterwards, yet no. We need to really work on our own to develop ourselves, our own systems, which you are good at. So I still believe that we need to do more. Uh, I strongly believe if one day Africa will be united, Africa will have one government, Africa will have one president, Africa will have one foreign policy, uh, one economic policy, we would develop to be to become a great economic continent on on earth but anyway we still have a work some work to do so we should continue to discuss to share this the research and to share these knowledges that we are sharing today so today I, I don't have much i was doing most of the listening thank you so much <laughs> yeah senator you've said it all in terms of governance and education and so on thank you so much on saturdays we meet and we discuss um, unification specifically and the need for one uh, continental government. Uh, Senator, feel free, if you want to do a presentation for us, uh, feel free to, to do so. We, should, we are we'll be happy to, to hear your presentation on your thoughts on unification. Thank you no, so much. No, no thank you so much. I'll do the presentation on Saturday. I'll... If I'm if if uh, I'm around, I'll definitely do that. Uh, thank comment. you so much, yeah, brother, brother Pigeon. Yes. Uh, just to let you know, Senator Morgan was a senator in Zimbabwe in the previous regime, yes. senator, but he now yes. formed also a revolutionary party from his side. So we got to know each other when he came to Kenya. Just to let you know. Excellent. Yeah. No, it, it's it's great. Um. Thank you so much. Great that we have. Yeah, thank you, Brother Senator. I mean, it's great that um, I, I have always felt comfortable when we are discussing consensusism because it is a tested philosophy and ideology. It's come from the father of Pan-Africanism on the African continent, Kwame Nkrumah himself. I'm always confident. And the tragedy is that we don't have more senators um, looking at this philosophy and ideology. And if Brother Senator can help us to speak to other senators and other lawmakers at that level, that would be really great. So thank you very much. Let's now hear from Sister Mali. I'll come back to you. I know your hands are up. 
Is it a question? If not, um, if it's a question you can't ask? No, I just wanted to add to what um, the last person was saying about, um, you know, the system. Um, okay, okay. Hold, yeah, hold, hold your thought. So All right. would you like me to it, see? You know. No, 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 no. Do you want me to consider this as your contribution? Yeah. Okay, carry on. Thank you. Yeah. What I wanted to say is if they, uh, it, 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 our original um, way of doing things was th the best. But if the new way that they've brought things to us, if they were to do it fairly, then it could work or even a combination of the old way and the, the um, new way. But it's, it's, it's the injustice of how they do it because like we're saying about how France making sure that you, they take X amount of money, well, almost all your money. And then if you need any money, you've got to get it back from them with a loan. That's absolute, you know, oh, I don't even know a word, you know, criminality. You know, because yeah, well, you're right. It's, it's so, madness. It's, so it's new, the system, new, new colonial madness. Sorry. No, I said I'm. I'm saying yes. You are right. It's new colonial yes, madness, so, really. I, I, absolutely. So the the whole way of the injustice of how they've put things in place and do it behind people's back that people don't. In, even understand and then they've got this secrecy that once you're in government you don't mention about the you know disparity of how things is done so badly to affect your country and affect your people and then as for this religion that they've uh, uh, instilled in your brain that uh, you know, if you give and if you this and whatever you have, you'll, you know, you'll see a better life in the next, in the future or, or, or whatever. And um, I just think it's just the system that they created that is um, held Africa down. It's, it destroyed Africa. In fact, it destroyed the whole world. It's just greed. Greed and 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 wickedness because you cannot be taking what somebody has got and then giving it back to them in a loan and um and then create chaos in the meantime and then impoverish the people and then on top of it you learn them a com you you force them to learn a complete new language and they've got to use your language as their main language to operate. So you do everything to put them right back and let them start a complete and utter new beginning. And then when you've got them to do that, you let them embrace everything about what you've created because you've eradicate letting them know anything about what they have been capable of doing. In fact, you make it seem as if you're the one that taught them anything that they know. And I think if we were to look deeper into the issues that occur, those are the major problem that has destroyed Africa. You know, the thievery, the thuggery, the lies. Um, and, you know, we, we could just go on. And obviously, they just devise so many, so many things, so many things, and um, it, it has destroyed the continent. And I think once people are beginning to find this out, which people are now, um, putting it back together again is, is a major puzzle. Because even right now in Libya, where the country uh, they've lost nearly a city.
20,000 people they said die. It's like, is that the amount of people in London that is meant to have disappeared? And it's because of their interference in the country and what needed doing as not, you know, firming up the gully and whatever was needed to be done before the chaos has happened. The infrastructure started falling apart um, with the last, what is it, 10 years or more that they've killed Gaddafi and, and now they've lost the city. And I can't understand when they just do these things and they talk about it. They're telling you that the government is not there anymore. There's two fraction of government not telling you that since they've gotten rid of Gaddafi, they've got chaos in Libya, which has now helped to this, the destruction of the country. So they miss out major parts when they're telling you about things that's happened in Africa because people just thought Africans was incapable. They didn't realize there's a structure that has been created to put the African in the situation they're in. Anyway, I think I've said enough. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Marlene, for your very um, eloquent and, and, and clear exposition there. Let's hear from uh, Dr. Herman, please. We haven't heard from a few more people. We need to hear from everybody in 10 minutes before we close today's class at nine o'clock. Dr. Herman. Yeah, good evening, everyone, comrades. Um, thanks, I uh, was been listening and uh, really very interesting. And I will give my experience. Um, I'm from Eritrea and, you know, uh, the US, especially Amnesty International and the European Union usually accuse uh, uh, the Eritrean government of religious persecution. You know, I remember uh, there was one Eritrean when I was a student, the president came in the African Union uh, 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 gathering in Durban in 2002. And this guy asked him, why are you pr prosecuting us? I mean, why are you actually taking us to jail uh, for our religious beliefs and so on? And the president replied, we have had a church, you know, this Orthodox church. I mean, it's old church, like the similar to the Ethiopian one. And we have had also uh, people who are Muslims who were existing with us, you know, for centuries. And apparently these pastors who come from Canada or Netherlands or some European countries from the USA, they started coming in the 1990s and uh, were freely preaching, uh, having their church at home or whatever. But what I noticed myself is these are people actually who come to weaken and victimize the mind of our youth. They usually tell people, no, you should just expect this will happen to you from God. You shouldn't work hard. You don't have to worry and so on. So it was actually a tool used to actually weaken the society somewhere, somehow. But they are very tricky in the way they do it. So uh, now we will find in Eritrea that you can go to church, do, do that. But these uh, false pastors from Europe and so on are not allowed to operate. And people shouldn't follow them. And I mean, uh, it can... I mean, people can be taken to prison. I mean, I don't want anyone to be jailed, but it's some sort of rehabilitation because some of our youth are easily manipulated and they weaken them not to, you know, not to work hard. Oh, you don't go to national service, for example. For example, the Jehovah Witnesses said at one time in point, we are heavenly, we're not going to pay tax, we're not going to go to the national service and so on and so forth. So what I'm saying is, uh, in our even old religion, uh, you know, being successful materially uh, is not a sin. You know, it is actually a blessing. That is how we how we see it. You know, our forefathers, our fathers. But this uh, narrative was almost changing with the coming of this, you know, uh, false religious people trying to weaken our society. 
because through that, I mean, you know that in Kenya, they say uh, they came with the Bible and people closed their eyes. Once they opened their eyes, then the land was gone. Yeah, because they just used religion actually to uh, undermine you know the capability of our people also to lose our resources so um you know uh, having a secular government is very important in africa and materialism should not be seen as a sin you know yes we are all spiritual people but that doesn't mean that uh, we cannot use our uh, and mobilize our resources properly. So, you know, that's why, I mean, in Rwanda, for example, Paul Kagame found about 700 churches in Kigali, and he was shocked. Okay, what, what were these 700 churches doing, you know? Who are actually operating there? Why are they doing that? So we need to actually, you know, I know some of our people do not understand the intricacy of this what we call Christianity that is imported from Europe and US and so on. We need to conscientize our people that, uh, you know, it's not about hating religion or being Christian or Muslim or whatever. It's about how actually you use it in life. So that is uh, what I wanted to contribute. We need to, I mean, we, I'm here in South Africa, we see a lot of People, I I went to a Universal Church. About two thousand people attended. The preacher was a white person, and almost two thousand of us black people. So I was actually even questioning why two thousand of us here, but we are be being preached. I'm not. I don't mind somebody preaching, but I question the you know the legitimacy of such kind of church where you know give some food and clothes, and so on, to actually manipulate the mind of our youth. So that is my contribution for today. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Herman. I think you've uh, heard about me? on the, yes, on the inside, outside thesis. Yes, Brother Pigeon. Yeah, I'm sure when you go to South Africa, you meet uh, Brother Herman. He's a lecturer in South Africa and from Eritrea. Okay, which, which city, South Africa? I'm in Cape Town. I teach at the Cape oh, Peninsula oh, Cape University of Technology. I'm in the journalism department. Thanks. Yeah, there, there is a possibility of my coming to South Africa in November, November but it's still, it's still to be confirmed. I mean, that's what brought up. You, you are welcome. Speak. I'm here for you. Thanks. Uh, th thank you. So we, we still have to hear from at least two more people before we go. But unfortunately, we have only three minutes. We will have to share it amongst them. One of them is Brother Koko, and one is our own Brother Glenroy. And Brother Koko, you come in first, please. Revolutionary uh, greetings to all of you, comrades, brothers, and sisters. I respect you this evening. And I thank you for uh, very interesting discussions. You have all made very, very important contributions. Thank you. So what I'm going to do, because I have a limited amount of time, is to talk about principal agency theory this evening. Because uh, Dr. Nkuma talked about the worker being held down uh, for what he has created by his labor and sweat. And they, he doesn't have enough brain power. Or labor is way too useless without capital and should always be subservient to, to capital. The worker is as much entitled to the fruit of his or her sweat as a capitalist is uh, entitled to whatever capital produces. Capitalism in this case is the outside and it's keeping the labor down and profiting at its expense. The worker is a principal here and he is delegating his labor to the capitalist who goes to make money, but that money doesn't come back to him uh, and his children but it goes to the capitalist instead. All should be complementary. Capital is nothing without labor. Capitalism exported from Europe, the master servant uh, relationships to the Americas in the form of slave master relationships, and then back to Africa in the form of colonial master, colonized African relationships. 
which still continues to date, even without the colonial master being there. The question here is, why is Mnagangwa appointing, Mnagangwa appointing his family members to positions of power when he's not a stooge of the West? He's not the Bazoom in this case. Why does he continue to do that? Because we have been brainwashed. And why are the children of Mwena Mutapa Empire, Mozambique, Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe, not breaking down the, the borders and living together and trading? Thank you very much, comrade. Thank you very much, Brother Coco, for your inspirational contribution. Uh, last but not the least, our own Brother Glenn Roy hasn't shared his thinking yet. Brother Glenn Roy. I just logged in to have a listen, comrade. Uh, you think you ran out of time. So thank you very much for inviting me to speak. But at the moment, I'm just relaxing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brother Glenroy. Oh, oh, um, always a diplomat. <laughs> <laughs> brother Thank Kwame, so... can I say a big hello to br Brother Glenroy because he's left us and we're missing him. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. <laughs> brother Glenroy, you heard that. We are missing you. Um, so thank, <laughs> thank you all for coming. Um, this is 9 o'clock and that brings us to the end of our class. We did start late. Uh, we didn't start late, but you know, we did start late, um, but we'd always finish on time so that we are known for, 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 for keeping time. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Uh, that's it from us. See you all on Saturday to discuss the unification of Africa. Uh, I'll start playing the music and please you may leave the word you feel like it. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.